In Dead Rising's Infinity Mode, your health is constantly ticking down and food items are limited. The only way to extend the amount of healing you get is through the books and by killing survivors. For most players, this will just amount to killing the survivor, looting them for any food and good weapons, then leaving or waiting for their health to get low enough. But have you ever stopped to think about what the survivors drop? Is there any significance to what six items take up their inventory? What about their spawn locations? Does that mean anything? Maybe. Well, in this video, I'm gonna go over each individual spawn in the Infinity Mode, because it turns out there's no video that's done that either, and see if there's anything of significance to that survivor or psychopath, from their loot to their location to their AI patterns. All the footage was gathered by myself, so yes, I did go through this mode again. No, I'm not entirely sure what compelled me to do this. If you're wondering why I felt the need to even clarify this was my footage, it's because, unlike my tier list, I did not put on my happy face. It's because I was not happy doing this. This mode is exhausting. And, just in case that's not enough, I was challenging myself to do it on a profile that didn't have the Mega Buster. What are we waiting for? Let's start with the first two people you meet, Otis and Paul. Otis is on the rooftop right outside the safe room, and Paul awaits you on the entrance plaza, since the door is actually never welded shut in this mode. Making these two the first possible encounters was a really smart move. Otis trying to kill the player on site really sells the idea that everyone here is out to kill you, and the fact that he needs to climb up a step to reach you when you enter there gives you a moment to respond to his presence. The same goes for Paul, since he's on the other side of the entrance plaza and on the second floor, so you have time to react to him no matter where you enter from. Paul, a late-game psychopath appearing in the entrance plaza, also teaches you another thing about survivors. They can spawn anytime, anywhere. Otis is armed with an unheated frying pan, likely just so that way he can't reasonably kill you. The thing will barely hurt you. The weapons he drops are actually pretty good this early in the game, especially the mailbox and the broom. This is likely just to give the player some fairly powerful weapons right away, since the game starts at midnight and the zombies will be in peak berserk mode. He also gives raw meat, an unusually high healing item for a survivor. This gives you a bit of buffer room if you manage to take a lot of damage early on, especially from him somehow, and it will remind the player that certain food items will degrade over time if they're not cooked or eaten fast enough, an otherwise very minor mechanic from the main game. Paul has a chance to teach the player a harsh lesson very early on. Enemies will only drop their loot if Frank lands the killing blow. As for his actual loot, Paul sets the standard of dropping a minor healing item, a modest one, and a six block healing item. In this case, a squash, an orange, and a well-done steak. Up next is Susan, who's already dead when she's encountered in the warehouse. This is likely done just to make it clear to players that any dead survivors will drop loot. You know, since you might have just run past Otis the moment he tried to kill you. Her loot box can be described as the Senior Citizen Starter Kit. A paint can, step ladder, pet food, cookies, a handbag. I don't know if this is an intentional joke on what they observed about senior citizens when they went to America to see the malls, or if they're just given the already dead survivor more mediocre items. All three versions of Carlito appear in this mode, and unlike most bosses, they never deviate in spawn location, though their times are different. The machine gun and truck boss variants will be available right from the get-go, though his sniper variant won't appear until day two. I'm just lumping them in here for consistency. They all follow the same general loot drops. Two low-grade healing items, one of which will always be a bag of chips, a well-done steak, some sports equipment, and a submachine gun. Food Carlito is easily the most generous of the three, since his second low-grade healing item is yogurt, healing two blocks instead of one. The others drop corn and cabbage. That said, there's no significance to anything they drop. Rounding up the characters who spawn right away, it's the Hall family. They appear in Leisure Park, the roof of the picnic area to be precise. All three share the exact same loot box. A box of cookies, an orange, a golden brown pizza, a hunting knife, and an axe. The cooked pizza only heals four blocks instead of the six blocks a well-done steak would. This doesn't matter if you get all three health books, since anything that heals four blocks or up now becomes a full heal. But if you're only using the survival book, then you're gonna want to be careful. Individually, these are the worst loot drops of any individual boss tier enemy besides the convicts, but collectively they're the most profitable of any single encounter. The choice to put them in the park could be a play on the idea of a family picnic, or it could be as simple as taking advantage of the fact that they have infinite range. At 7am, new characters spawn while some old ones will despawn if not yet slain. First up is Bill, who spawns in the hardware store, and he'll shoot you the moment you load into the place. This is probably why he's armed with nothing more than a nail gun, so you'll barely get hurt. And that's good, since he'll never stop shooting and will probably never miss. 
This situation is almost certainly designed to take advantage of his AI's absurd efficiency with guns without completely screwing the player over this early into the run. The only thing he drops is melted ice pops in terms of healing, so you only get one block of health. But at least they won't melt on you, right? His other important drop is the machete, which is probably the reason why he's here in the first place. This also starts the trend of survivors being capable of dropping boss tier weapons. Speaking of bosses, Larry will spawn in the meat processing area, and man is he a real bastard. The presence of the zombies completely messes with his AI, meaning he will never relax and will always be aggroed onto you. And since his favorite move in the infinite mode is throwing his meat around, and his meat hits harder than the literal meat truck Carlito chased you in here with, Larry is the first proper run killer. I'd go as far as to say he's the most dangerous enemy in the infinite mode here. Obviously he drops his meat cleaver, but his loot box is interesting. He drops a yogurt, an orange, and spitfire. You'd think he'd drop some cooked meat or anything, given how many of the other psychopaths have dropped well-done steaks. But remember, spitfire is what you get when you put two raw meats into a blender. This also marks the start of psychopaths dropping mixed drinks, which is the only way to get them in this mode since the blenders are completely removed. The last of the three survivors is Donna from the game's intro. Her AI has a weird quirk of where she just walks around before running, but beyond that, nothing of her seems to be of note other than this is a survivor from the intro that can now spawn. Her loot does include thawed vegetables, which I guess is meant to complement Bill's melted ice pops. Starting at 7pm, the next and final set of survivors from day one will spawn. First up is Sally, who spawns on the rooftop. She drops an apple and is armed with a regular cleaver, which hits a little harder than the average hunting knife will. I'm pretty sure the only reason she drops an apple instead of a one-block healing item is because most players would never think to even check the rooftop for survivors, but nothing else she drops is noteworthy. On the opposite end is Alan, who spawns in the CD store in North Plaza. Since the zombies can quickly get to him and his ability to fight back is limited, this actually mimics the game's introduction where Alan can be killed very quickly by getting overwhelmed, although his health is noticeably higher in this mode. Because he can easily get killed before Frank ever reaches him, getting to him and defeating him rewards the player with raw meat, which can easily become a full heal if you cook it and have the survival book. Adam the Clown is technically the final spawn of day one, and he appears in Wonderland Plaza like in story mode, albeit right outside of the food court instead of next to the space ride. You really need to be careful when fighting him. The usually sound tactic of hurting him with his own lead balloons is actually very dangerous, since if the lead balloon actually kills him, you won't get any of his items besides the small chainsaws. On that note though, you do get both of them when he dies. He drops a Japanese radish, a golden brown pizza, and an untouchable from his box. A more profitable than usual box, probably because he's one of the more dangerous bosses though in terms of raw damage. The Japanese radish might also be a nod to how the Japanese tourist mission happens right next to his. The untouchable, on the other hand, is almost certainly a joke on how his chainsaws can block melee attacks and break the weapon, making Adam almost literally untouchable. The start of day two begins with Carlito's sniper boss spawning, but we already covered that. The Hall family and the other two versions of Carlito, along with Adam, will still carry over the day two if you haven't slain them yet. The first of the new spawns is Isabella in Alfresca Plaza. Great. What might very well be my least favorite boss, and what is easily my least favorite section of the mall. My own personal hell. She is the only character in the game who drops a shotgun without directly wielding one herself. She also drops Energizer, but I don't think that's of much significance here. It could be a nod to how Isabella dying is not allowed for the story to reach the true ending. I guess. She also drops milk and cookies. Rather, this is a nod to her becoming one of the good guys in the story, since good little boys and girls lay out cookies for Santa. Or if it's literally no deeper than cookies go great with milk is anyone's guess. Meanwhile, right outside the safe room, you'll find Mindy. Oh, hey, my favorite survivor. With a handgun. She's a bit more aggressive with it than you might initially think, and she drops an orange when defeated. I think this is nothing more than the ginger survivor drops the ginger fruit. The rest of her inventory, while actually quite useful, isn't really indicative of anything. But if that seemed insignificant, then you should see Nick. He spawns in the movie theater, which is likely where he gets his shirt from, and that's about as noteworthy as it gets. None of his drops have anything to do with it anything, other than maybe the stepladder being a joke on how he was out of reach in his story mode mission, but then you would think Sally would have dropped one as well. Starting at 7am, Lindsay from the intro spawns already dead on the helipad. Her loot is almost strictly pet food, to no surprise, and it's a clear nod to her dog Madonna. Although she does give a baseball bat and an uncooked pizza, 
She's an easter egg spawn, practically speaking. Something that I did not record is that she's one of the only survivors in the game who causes an extra weapon spawn, as a fourth bag of pet food can be found on the side of the helipad. Tad spawns in Paradise Plaza, in the jewelry store right next to where Kent's held him hostage. He is way more durable than you might expect, and the sword that he's armed with gives him both range and damage. His sole food drop is cheese. But I find it funny that they give him a skateboard to drop when there's an infinite spawn of skateboards right next to him. Rich spawns in the food court with an SMG, spawning more or less where Carlito did. If he actually manages to notice Frank climbing up, he can cause a lot of trouble since unlike Carlito, he never needs to reload. Once defeated, he obviously drops his SMG in a carton of milk. Combine that with his above average health, he's effectively a mini boss of the mode. 7 p.m., time for the survivor shuffle. First is Debbie in the meat processing area. Her food drop isn't great, it's just a zucchini. The real highlight is the ceremonial sword in her loot box. If you're willing to carry the criminal biology book, this becomes as durable as the laser sword. Since triple booking the small chainsaw isn't viable, the sword actually becomes the most long-lasting weapon you can get outside of said laser sword, as it lasts for 100 hits, compared to the small chainsaw's 80, and survivors drop them about once every two days, compared to Adam, where you have to wait basically the entire seven-day survivor run to get another two of them. Cliff spawns in the home saloon, being one of the few bosses who can only spawn in his normal location since his AI is so reliant on the trapdoors. Sadly, his loot crate is easily the worst in terms of healing from the psychopaths. He drops two one-block vegetable items and randomizer. Objectively speaking, randomizer heals eight blocks of health, so he does give you more than the usual boss. It's also thematically appropriate, since the trapdoor gimmick means he can quite literally randomly appear throughout the area. Practically speaking, this drink will make you sick more often than not, and unlike Dead Rising 2, loading screens don't get rid of sickness, so it also doesn't help that when you get sick, you drop your weapon. Frankly, the machine gun he drops is far more useful than his food, as well as being an obvious nod to his military roots. Kendall spawns in the warehouse with an acoustic guitar, and he's easily the most aggressive survivor you'll encounter. He's the only survivor who actually has no delay whatsoever to his attack aside from Bill, and since he has a melee weapon, he can very easily stun lock you and that can be a death penalty if your health is low enough. The only food item he drops is a pie, which may or may not be an unintended reference. It is assumed by many of the players that Kendall is a restaurant owner, given how well-dressed he is for such a small town. This makes the pie that he drops, which can only be found in the restaurants in the mall, a very fitting food item. Finally, Joe spawns on the rooftop, and is the only psychopath to do so. You'll probably see her make more use of her handgun here than she does during the story mode. She drops both her pistol and her nightstick, and her stun gun is placed in her inventory box. Her food drops are lettuce, a melon, and zombate. I'm genuinely surprised they didn't just give her two melons given the nature of her cutscenes in the story mode. Second, the zombate is a joke on how she has the most meat on her of any character in the game, making her quite literal zombate. Let's give it up for day three! <laughs> day three, time for fresh meat. The only boss that will carry over at this point is Carlito down there in the tunnels. Now's as good of a time as any to mention that killing him early on might just be a good idea to make it safer going down there. The first new boss to spawn are the convicts. Their AI is somehow even worse in this mode. They also don't drop any food at all. This is technically because, thanks to an exploit, you could kill one or two of them, grab the food, leave and come back, and the two you kill will have respawned. I still think that was a dumb call, but that's a rant for another day. Pamela, the younger of the twin sisters, spawns in Ripper's Blade in North Plaza, and is armed with a handgun. Nothing about her Luke strikes me as being indicative of anything, other than maybe the CDs being a joke on how teenagers and young adults love their music. I do personally find it funny that she drops a baguette, though, but that's only because she and her sister strike me as the I never have bread ever kind of girls. The final midnight spawn of day three is Greg, spawning in the security room. That actually makes sense, since he knows his way around the mall better than anyone else, and is the only survivor to know about the security room when Frank brings it up. He also marks the point where survivors can start to appear in the security room. Honestly, the most noteworthy thing about his loot box is what it doesn't include, a frying pan. He's armed with a broken push broom. But after Otis and Adam both had frying pans and push brooms in their inventory, I was starting to think the game was just having a running gag of that being something all the mall employees have at that point. I guess not. At 7am, we get a new batch. Beth spawns in the warehouse, but nothing about her loot appears to be significant. Same goes for Tanya in Alfresca Plaza's brand new U. So the next big one is the psychopath Kent, who is in Paradise Plaza. 
although he spawns at the bottom center of the plaza instead of the top like in story mode. He drops pie, coffee creamer, and a well-done steak. Finally, Gil spawns in the men's warehouse in the entrance plaza, uh, the store where you can get the golden suit. It should come off as no surprise that he drops a wine when defeated, both playing into his alcoholism as well as giving him the single best healing item of any given hostile survivor. What is interesting is that he maintains his drunken hobble. In the infinity mode, all survivor movement penalties are removed, and they stick to their default movement speed. This is why some survivors can move a bit weird. Since he's stuck to his drunken hobble, he will slowly make his way to Frank, but he'll also never need to stop to catch his breath. 7pm sees Josh spawn on the helipad, and he's ironically using the machete to try and attack you, making him a little more dangerous than the average hostile survivor up until that point. He drops a grapefruit and some useful but innocuous weapons when defeated. In Wonderland Plaza, you'll find Sean. When defeated, he drops some corn, cheese, and a quick step. I so badly want the corn to be a reference to the cult film Children of the Corn, but I seriously doubt that. The quick step, on the other hand, is certainly a nod to how Sean is the fastest boss in the game. If you head from there to the movie theater, you'll find Jonathan, one of the gunshop trio, in Movie Theater 5. He's armed with a proper machine gun, although he tends to not notice Frank entering the theater, so he won't often pose much of a threat. He probably has the best drop of any survivors up until this point, offering his machine gun, some milk since he can take a lot of health off if he actually does see you, and a lot of the better weapons in the game. Cletus is the last spawn of this wave, and he's easily the hardest, another run killer. But if you can beat him, the gun shop will be safe again, and you will have the single best food drop in the entire game in terms of healing. A grapefruit, a wine, and a well-done steak. The wine is likely meant to be the same wine he heals with during the fight. He also drops a battle axe and a sledgehammer, just to really sell home the fact that he's one of the strongest bosses in the game, in terms of raw damage at least. Day 4 At the start of Day 4, Cletus will still be around, and he'll stick around until about halfway into it. The convicts and Truck Carlito will also still be driving around if you haven't slain them yet. In Wonderland Plaza, you'll find Ryan, the guy in charge of the barricades in the intro. He's armed with a golf club, which The Last of Us Part 2 has completely destroyed the ability for me to ever take seriously again. But it also just so happens that Jeff Meyer is armed with a golf club. I really don't think this is meant to be an intended reference. I just find it interesting that Ryan and Jeff share not only animations, but even the same voice actor, Phil Farmer. Wayne spawns in the meat processing area. It's pretty funny that what might very well be the fattest survivor in the game is in the meat shop. Nothing appears to be of no other than another out-of-the-way survivor dropping an apple. The big spawn this time is Steven. He's one of the only two bosses in the game who cannot appear in their story mode location. In this case, it's because the supermarket is closed for the entire mode. Instead, he's in the food court. If you can kill him while he has his shotgun out, he actually will drop it. Allegedly. I've never been able to get it to happen, so good luck. Otherwise, he drops zucchini, milk, and nectar. Really, nectar? You'd think they would have given that to Carlito. Eh, whatever. The referential aspect of his drops are the two nail guns. I'm positive these are meant to be the two nail guns he used to make his weapons cart. 7am of Day 4 has what is easily the most interesting group of survivors to spawn in this entire mode. First is Sinji, who is completely unarmed. This is almost certainly just meant to be a joke. He also gives yogurt instead of a one-block healing item, probably because it's easy for the zombies to overwhelm him. You'll find him in the coffee shop right outside Alfresca Plaza. Then there's Ross in the music shop in Paradise Plaza. This dude is an outright tank as far as survivors go. He has more health than any version of Carlito does, if I'm not mistaken. And he can attack very quickly with his knife. Similar to Rich before him, he's practically a mini-boss. I'd wager this is why he drops the mighty orange juice when defeated. He also drops a stuffed animal. I imagine this was meant to be for Tanya. Interestingly enough, he and Tanya both wield the same weapon, something the game just doesn't do with other connected survivors. Finally, there's Varlene and Alyssa in Movie Theater 4. This is the only time two survivors spawn together, and actively work together at that. Varlene is just armed with wood and is no more dangerous than any other survivor. Alyssa, on the other hand, has an SMG, is very trigger-happy, very accurate, and, unlike most other survivors with guns up until this point, knows how to turn around, so sneaking up on her is actually very difficult. They're the survivors who easily did the most damage to me this run, and that's keeping in mind I let some survivors damage me just to get some footage of them. They also serve as a mini-boss of sorts, with Varlene being the fodder and Alyssa being the real threat. Alyssa drops cheese instead of Varlene's mere vegetable, and her weapon drops are far more vicious than Varlene's, right down to dropping a ceremonial sword, likely in reference to where you fought them. 7pm is much tamer, with only two survivors spawning. First is Kay in the warehouse. 
Her sole food item is corn and her loot box is unremarkable, but it is ironic that she's armed with a nightstick. Jolie spawns in the home saloon. She's armed with a fire axe, I guess to imply that she found it in that very store. She also starts the running gag of women carrying perfume props in their inventory. She's also the first survivor to give frozen vegetables at this point. Day 5. Carlito in the maintenance tunnels will finally despawn, but the convicts will still be out and about. Two more survivors from the intro plaza spawn, Brian and Todd. Todd is on the helipad while Brian is modern businessman in Wonderland Plaza. Brian himself is actually really aggressive, but nothing about their locations nor their weapons are remarkable. The big deal right now is that zombies will start to spawn in the security room, although not in the ventilation area. Simone spawns in a kid's store that me and my friends like to call JJ's in Entrance Plaza, and for some reason she drops milk. Uh, to be fair, the bowling ball she's armed with has some harsh knockback, but like most survivors, she can barely do half a block of damage, at least in the Xbox One version. Her loot also contains a demon mask, likely a reference to her being infected, since zombies at this time were still seen more as demonic monsters than anything else. Michelle can be found in Alfresca Plaza, and she has what is easily the most housewife inventory of any survivor in the game. Perfume, her only food item is a radish, and she drops a purse, a can of paint, and two clumps of gems. 7am sees Chris from the intro spawn in the security room, but nothing about his drops are of note. Same goes for you in the meat processing area. I hate it when survivors spawn down here, and you is hands down the most useless in terms of drops. Natalie spawns in the warehouse. She also doesn't have anything particular of note, though. The only thing of note around this time is Heather, who spawns in Movie Theater 1, and they gave her the same food item as Pamela. That's a cute little detail. At 7pm, Lily will spawn on the top floor of Paradise Plaza, and all I'll say is I really hope the horse mask that she drops is not a joke on the devs finding her ugly or something. Brett will spawn right outside the hunting shack, making him one of the only survivors to spawn in a hallway. Brett's armed with a shotgun, meaning him and Jonathan had their weapons swapped. I wonder if that was intentional. His ability to chip your health off reasonably fast with the shotgun is probably why he drops a golden brown pizza. Finally, Dr. Barnaby spawns in the hardware store as a zombie. He'll be right in front of the player, so there's no chance of you missing him. He does still drop items when slain, but don't expect much of a fight from him. In the original 360 version, Zombie Barnaby would actually respawn if you re-enter the area, but this was fixed in the re-releases. Granted, with two of his drops being rotten meat and spoiled pizza, grinding this one enemy for the apple over and over again was hardly practical, especially when he doesn't spawn for all that long. Baba Booey. On to day six, meaning you've made it through a full five days, you've rightfully earned your laser sword, assuming you haven't already gotten it. Kent will spawn in the warehouse, dropping the same things he did before. Yeah, day six starts the boss rush section of the infinity mode, where previously defeated or ignored bosses will respawn, often in different locations and far more frequently. Shelly? Uh, Shelly? Cheryl? I don't know how you pronounce her name. She spawns in the meat processing area, carrying two perfume props and two lipstick props. If this was Dead Rising 2, she would probably drop the sex toy as well, just for good measure. She drops a bag of chips when slain. Going down here for her food is honestly not worth it, but unlike you, she at least has a funny inventory. Joe has also respawned, this time in her proper boss fight location. Finally, a noticeably less injured Leia spawns in the storage room in the maintenance tunnels. 7am brings a lot of characters this time. Nathan is on the rooftop, armed with a ceremonial sword, making him the second survivor to be armed with his captor's weapon of choice. His loot box also drops a machete, so he's tied with Adam for the most boss weapons a single character drops. Larry spawns in the North Plaza, being noticeably less dangerous since he can't toss his meat around, and the Hall family will spawn in the Entrance Plaza like they normally would. All of them hold what they did previously. Ronald will appear in the larger bookstore of Paradise Plaza, and drops frozen vegetables when defeated. I am surprised, and frankly let down, that the rest of his inventory isn't canned food and cooking oil. Bert will spawn on the rooftop with a battle axe, and he's aggressive enough for that to be a problem. If you weren't literally guaranteed to have a laser sword by now, he'd be a pretty big threat. You'll get a coffee creamer for ending his misery, although the rest of his loot is quite underwhelming. Steven spawns in the home saloon with his usual drops. Leroy will spawn in Alfresca Plaza's hardware store, and he's armed with fish. Given that the frozen fish are among the strongest weapons in the game, this actually makes him very dangerous. Most of his inventory is also fish, which is probably just meant to be a gag. But when combined with his outfit, I'm really starting to wonder if he was meant to be a fisherman at some point. 
With the arrival of 7 p.m., Carlito will return to the food court with his SMG, and Cletus will return to the gun shop with his shotgun, both with the same drops as before. The convicts will also respawn by now, even if you've permanently killed them. The new survivors are Barbara and Janet. Barbara is in the security room with a sledgehammer, but nothing else about her loot really seemed of note. Janet is found in the beautification stand in Wonderland Plaza. This is likely a reference to her being considered one of the most attractive survivors in the game. The fact that she drops milk is likely a reference to her having the largest breast size of any woman in the game, Jessie included. The fact she has the machete is concerning. Oh my god! Alright, made it to day 7, just 24 hours away from unlocking your fancy underpants. Carlito is back in the tunnels, and Adam is now jumping around in Paradise Plaza, and you'll find Sean back in Movie Theater 4. All of them drop what you would expect them to, with the exception of Sean. He has a unique extra item he can drop when you defeat him, a key to the locked storage room in the movie theater, which gives you a respawning machine gun. A nice little reward for making it this far, and to make sure you last a bit longer. On the helipad, Brock will have spawned. He's the other guy who can't spawn in his normal location. He still has all of his moves from the story mode, including his instant kill attack, but you can also attack him from a distance, so he's much easier to defeat here. He drops another machine gun when defeated, and gives a bunch of uncooked food. Two uncooked pizzas and two raw meats to be exact. This is in theory because he can drain a lot of health if you try to fight him fairly, but it could also just be to give you an extra bit of breathing room if you've made it this far. Rachel spawns in the warehouse, but there's nothing of note with her. If you go to Alfresca Plaza's hamburger stand, you'll find David. The funny thing is that his inventory features a cash register. Maybe in this mode he actually did try to loot the supermarket. 7am sees sniper rifle Carlito and Cliff all respawn in their normal locations and with their normal drops. Ray will spawn in the food court with a machine gun. He's effectively a special forces in sheep's clothing, as he'll already be aggroed by shooting the zombies to defend himself, and he has the health of an early game psychopath. He drops a well done steak for the efforts of killing him, since he's easily one of the most dangerous survivors. Gordon is in the meat processing area, but there's nothing of no other than you have to go down here again. Sophie appears in the security room armed with a sword. Her less aggressive nature doesn't matter much with how small the room is, so she can actually cause some damage if you don't take her seriously. She drops coffee creamer and is yet another female survivor with the perfume prop. 7pm marks what is easily the least remarkable group of survivors in terms of drops. Kelly appears in Ye Olde Toy Box in Paradise Plaza, but drops nothing of note. She's not even particularly well armed in my opinion. Paul and Isabella spawn in their story mode locations with their previous loot drops as well. The only noteworthy character to spawn is a zombified Jessie. She actually has a bit of a health boost, which, when combined with it being night, means that she can survive a handgun bullet to the head. And even then, her drops are the exact same as the zombified Dr. Barnaby, complete with the same trivia about being able to respawn in the 360 version. I guess since I didn't explain the joke the first time, the rotten meat and pizza is a joke on how they're expired humans. I really hope I didn't need to actually explain that to anyone, though. Am I dead yet? Alright, you've made it to Day 8, the final day of Survivor spawning. You already have the 7 day Survivor achievement by now, so this is just for bragging rights. Also, Brock will still be alive if you haven't killed him yet. Jennifer spawns in the entrance plaza on the second floor, far end to boot. Armed with a battle axe, I imagine she's here to warn players that the survivors on the final day are going to be far more aggressive, as she's very quick to start killing zombies and trying to hunt Frank down. She drops an orange juice. Kind of surprised that she isn't in the movie theater, but that's where you find Floyd instead. He's armed with only a shovel, and disappointingly, nothing from the antique shop nor a single work of art can be found in his inventory. Missed opportunity. 7am sees Aaron spawning in the men's clothing store in Paradise Plaza, and the stuffed bear mask might very well be a reference to his soft, cowardly nature in the story mode. Meanwhile, in that maintenance tunnel storeroom, Kathy will spawn with a handgun. Nothing about her loot is a reference to anything, but she does drop a machete and a frozen pizza, so she's more of a reward for people who've survived this long and were willing to venture underground again. At 7pm, the last two survivors spawn. Brad is in the meat processing area, armed with a katana, and is one of the most aggressive survivors in this mode, serving as a mini-boss since he can rapidly deal a lot of damage to Frank, on top of being very capable of dealing with the zombies in the room. I find it weird that he drops an SMG this late into the game, given that plenty of survivors have given you proper machine guns by now. 
And then there's Jeff, who spawns in the spaghetti restaurant at the food court. Nothing about his loadout is particularly noteworthy, but it is fitting that the first two survivors Frank meets that aren't hostile or doomed to die instantly are the final two to spawn in the survival mode. I'm a bit bummed out that there weren't more references with the survivor loot, but a lot of the survivors really don't have much to work with to begin with. Like, for Jolie and Rachel, what are you supposed to give them? Everything about their characters are related to the fact that they're scared about the zombies, they're friends, and they regret splitting up. And since friendship rings are not a thing in the game, there's not a whole lot of ways to actually represent that with their item drops. And what about Cliff's hostages, or any of the victims of the Raincoat Cult? Most of these characters are nothing more than run-of-the-mill people reacting to the terrible situation, which usually amounts to, this sucks, get me out of here. It's realistic, which is nice for the story mode, but it doesn't give you much to work with as far as getting cheeky with their loot drops in this mode. I don't plan for this to be the last time I talk about the infinite mode, so instead, here's a list of statistics relating to the survivors and the weapons they drop that I haven't already gone over. Food items like the raw meat or frozen vegetables will not start to decay until the loot box is opened. The baseball bat is the most common weapon drop in the game from survivors, dropping a total of 17 times if I counted correctly. The machete is the most common boss drop, appearing 7 times in total. It is the most commonly wielded boss weapon, being used by 3 survivors and twice by Cliff. It is also the only boss weapon to be used by a survivor not held hostage by that psychopath. And it is the only weapon in the game that is wielded by survivors more often than it's dropped from a loot box, with a 4 to 3 spawn ratio. On the other end of the spectrum is the hunting knife, which has the worst drop-to-use ratio. A total of 15 are dropped by survivors and bosses, but only Tanya and Ross actually arm themselves with one. The heavy machine gun and the sniper rifles are the only guns to never be dropped through loot boxes. Brock is the only psychopath who never respawns. He's also the only character who drops four healing items. Sean is the only character, in a makeshift way, to reward the player with a respawning weapon. If we treat the expired and cooked versions of food as the same item, then the least common food drops in the mode are the mixed drinks, as each of the seven types of mixed drinks only spawn twice. Shampoo is the only weapon that cannot be acquired in the Infinity Mode, as it is not dropped by a single survivor or psychopath, and the supermarket, the only place you can naturally find it, is locked off. The heavy machine gun is technically the least common firearm drop. The handgun, on the other hand, is the most common. The Infinity Mode is the only time that the full death animations of Joe and Cletus can be seen. Rich is the only survivor to mimic a psychopath battle, with his location and his weapon of choice mimicking the first fight with Carlito. While the regular sword spawns more often than its boss counterpart, the boss version is used more often as a weapon, thanks to Sean spawning twice. If the player wishes to earn the Gourmet achievement in the Infinity Mode, there is a minimum number of enemies that must be slain, since they carry food items that do not naturally spawn on the ground. The minimum characters you'll need to defeat, in the earliest possible order, are Otis, Paul, a member of the Hall family, Dana, Bill, Larry, Adam, Isabella, Cliff, Joe, Gil, Sean, Steven, Jolie, and Kelly. This also means for that achievement you need to make it to the seventh day. Although this mode implies that everyone's gone crazy, hostile survivors do not count towards any achievements related to defeating psychopaths. Only 13 very precise psychopaths count towards these achievements. However, defeating the same psychopath that has respawned in the Infinity Mode will count as a second defeated boss. Not that there's any reason to earn the achievement this way. Finally, it is possible to earn the 7 day survivor achievement without defeating a single hostile enemy. If you arm yourself with all three health books, there are about a good nine days worth of food in the mall. Yet in the playthrough I did, which I would like to remind you was not an optimal playthrough, I was able to last about a good eight days on survivor food alone. With all that in mind, earning the achievement 7 Day Survivor is a battle of time investment, far more than it is about resource management.